Omar, thank you so much for joining. Can you give us an introduction? Yeah, Omar, co-founder and uh, CRO of Salesfinity, uh, a tech startup based out of San Francisco. What stage is the business at? There's a little bit of visibility there. Our hard launch was about less than a year ago, and we're at around a million in revenue today. Funded? Bootstrapped, actually. And we raised a very, very small angel round for the network and the advice. Tell me about Salesfinity. Tell me about, like, what does the business do for those listening? I think today it's incredibly hard to sell. We live in a world where the funding is drying up. Uh, things aren't kind of how they were a year or even a few months ago. And a lot of companies are faced with the same problems. They either need to hire loads of salespeople to hit specific metrics and targets to hit the steep revenue targets they've set as part of their funding plans or, or even companies starting from zero without funding. It's, it's a very saturated space today. Um, and to stand out, you need to have a great deal of volume in terms of activities, but also quality. Um, so what Salesfinity does is we turn a sales team into pretty much 10x the activity and the output by helping each salesperson to make up to 10 calls at the same time and pretty much five to 10 X their pipeline. So that uh, technology technically does what? Allows them to dial multiple people at the same time? Yeah, so it, it's an AI platform. It incorporates AI into different components of kind of the sales development or top of funnel. Um, it starts with enabling sales reps to make up to 10 calls at the same time and then have AI filter out machines, voicemails, which typically, you know, waste 70 to 90% mm. of the time a person is spending in their day making calls. So that's the first aspect and the central components to it. But then it completely automates workflows like um, getting data in from like CRMs and sales engagement platforms, sending data back out, recordings, notes, automating sequences. Um, and then it goes as far as even generating AI emails for follow-ups. Um, and yeah, what's coming is um, is mind blowing, but that's for the next uh, <laughs> next time. I remember when, when you first told me about it, I was like, wow, like totally got it. And remember the, the days dialing, you know, and probably like 45 seconds per call. Yeah. And that's why you were capped to like 50 dials an hour. Yeah. But now your technology allows teams to do 500 dials an hour, a thousand. That's incredi incredibly ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> um, it wouldn't be too crazy if someone could make between 200 to 300 calls an hour with Salesfinity. Yeah. Oh. So as you can tell, you can't buy time. You can get AI to save you time. Let's go back to the point where you and your co-founders, two of you, right? Yeah. Decided that to go into business first like what 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 happened there did you know each other we actually very non-traditional i think um it's not the standard story of we've been best friends since childhood i met my co-founder um who's an in incredibly intelligent guy with insane work ethic um through a mutual connection and we started just you know just uh, very casual hey I love what your uh, what you've been doing and what you what you're doing. You had a startup in the past that got acquired, and given my success in tech sales, he actually doesn't come from a sales background at all, but he does come from an entrepreneurial background. So I think, um, yeah, we pretty much um, started speaking, and then I um, started, I guess, advising him based on my experience on how we can tailor the product, how we can actually establish some initial traction um around closing customers and things like that so started off in an advisory role and then uh, one day he sent me a whatsapp message i still remember he said uh omar have you ever dreamt of uh, building a unicorn <laughs> 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 and then i said well hell yeah and uh, yeah let's do it together and the rest is history and it's generally how it went nice and how how long before launch <clears throat> had you been speaking it was when it was still in like MVP stage, okay. like very initial stages. Um, there was some initial traction. Um, there was some initial revenue, but it wasn't any um, anything contracted kind of like, you know, the very initial stages. But then we had to clear a lot of things up, change the pricing structure, um, change a lot of things about a platform and kind of pretty much relaunch. Um, and now we're on uh, version four, releasing version five in two weeks. 
cool. And this is where there's some exciting updates, version five. Yeah. Nice. Okay. <laughs> so, right. So, so just so that everybody can understand. So the, the MVP was already there. You got approached via WhatsApp and there was this opportunity for you to come in as a co-founder and start working on this together. And that was the, the really the starting point for you coming into the business. I think we realized that we are very, very different. And <clears throat> I used to fear difference, actually. I, I think that was one of my mistakes I made in the past. I, I tried to work with people that were actually very similar to me. Mm. And the more we worked together and the more we got to know each other, we realized that we're very, very different. But our differences are very complementary. And I think that's when it started to make a lot of sense that I could make a perfect co-founder to join him on his journey because... <clears throat> I have a very different way of thinking. I have a very different skill set, and uh, we just put put both things together. And I think that's definitely part of the fast growth we're experiencing today is that we really, really complement each other. What are some of those differences? Is he from a technical background? <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us more? He's a marketer by background, and um, then learned how to code by himself. So uh, pretty much self learned. Um, very technical gets super excited about new products and building new things and going to the moon um i am very i'm very realistic <laughs> um i'm incredibly ambitious but i'm very realistic and i think i'm very holistic as well as a person i like to i like to consider every aspect of things everything that could possibly go wrong but also every single opportunity out there um, so I think putting someone who's incredibly ambitious, very motivated, highly energetic, always wanting to build, ship new stuff, all the cool stuff in the world with someone who kind of slows things down, slows things down a little, likes to strategize, likes to sing, think things through and then putting the best, best of both together is kind of where it definitely clicks. I mean, beyond that on, on a, in a more detailed, um, to add more detail i think i like talking to people i like generally being a consultant he's a, a bigger picture kind of guy that's what i'm trying to say and for me i like to go into the details of things and i think being so detailed and i think that comes from my pharmacy background actually like attention to detail is one of the things I had on my CV for the for my whole life <laughs> um, with kind of making the bridge between the detail and the bigger picture is kind of where it clicks. You left a, I would imagine, well-paying job to join the startup, which was just Mavlin Beck at that point, or yeah. did you get a salary? No. We started off with no salary. Um, I had to think it through. I had to consult myself <laughs> my family um but i knew that the the opportunity made sense the person i was going to work with made sense and it was i mean you, you hear it all the time right opportunity at the right right place at the right time and that's genuinely what happened we launched a product that the market absolutely needed and still needs and it wasn't kind of a good to have um, you don't sell people a dream, you sell them an actual solution that brings them an ROI in one or two days. Um, so to me, that that really minimized the risk of kind of living without a salary, using up my savings, putting myself and my family in a dangerous position. Um, generally, I think it aligned with my long-term goals of being an entrepreneur. I knew no matter what kind of salary I was uh, I was going to be on or how much money I was going to make or how much career growth I was ever going to achieve, I, I wouldn't have kind of, that's not what life is about for me. It's about building my own thing, being able to make an impact directly, being able to come up with my own plans and actually put my work into, um, put my effort into, into my own work. And how long did that period go on when there was no salaries? It was. It wasn't. It wasn't actually a, a very long period, to be honest. And I think we expected it to go. We kind of started working together and saying, you know, look, I don't know if we're going to pay ourselves a salary. We, there's no money. I don't know what we're going to do. Let's figure it out as soon as you know <laughs> we can. Then let's do it. And that could be six months, could be a year, and it turned out to be just about two or three months. So it wasn't anything ridiculous. Nice. Uh you're a detailed guy, 
you've said that a couple of times. So like what level of detail did you go into as, a, you know, possibly joining this venture with a co-founder that you'd only known for however many months? Like what, what sort of, of detail were you going into to evaluate yeah. the opportunity? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think I tried to understand the traction or kind of what the market was saying. I mean, he, he had a, a, a great product. It was an initial um it was an initial product and it obviously gathered a lot of feedback um going as far as diving into the deals or the conversations he was having with potential customers understanding the why the business case understanding how it aligned with what priorities within the company um so kind of making going into the detail of how you convert an amazing product into a must have solution um understanding what was positive what was negative in terms of the feedback um churn patterns or if if there's any like if there are any initial customers that churned why did they churn how long did it take them to churn um how can we kind of bring them back um but more importantly also understanding every single thing about a product and also understanding areas where we could change the product or tailor it to i guess my personal experience in tech sales but also all the other people i've met who um who needed a product like that so you've mentioned it needs to be a must-have so for founders or possible founders that are listening like how do you categorize a must-have and how can you distinguish that between the nice to have there's so many different ways to look at it i think a must-have is where it's a very weird way of saying it but I think you know you're selling a must-have when you have a genuine two-way relationship with the person you're selling to. When you're constantly running after someone, constantly coming up with different ideas of changing their mind, um, selling them the bigger picture, uh, that's kind of when you know you have a good you have a good to have. When you have a must-have, you know your prospects will run after you pretty much you know you'll 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 feel the energy of hey the excitement of i need this today and that's not good enough i mean you, so many people need so many things and people are emotional but it's about why they need it and who else needs it and what the whole company can achieve with what you're selling um if the can pretty much if the company can survive for a year or two without your product it's a it's a it's a good to have if they need it to be able to survive, it's a must have. And that's the economy we're in today. You said at the start, you've not raised really venture capital. You obviously, you, you did a small you know, investment from, from advisors, angels. Was that a conscious decision to be bootstrapped? Because I guess yeah. you could have gone down the route of funding and salary on day one, but did you and your co-founder make that as, as a conscious decision? And if so, why? 100%. Again, for transparency, I, started off thinking about funding about how can we raise money let's meet investors and i think what was a massive learning experience for me was kind of i guess my co-founder really influenced that is let's do it a difficult way let's kind of squeeze ourselves out and then that's going to force us to build processes to bounce back from failures you, when you don't have the luxury of resource, you're absolutely utilizing every single minute, every single brain cell you have. And I think that definitely unlocks a new person within you. Pers like, honestly, that's that's how it felt that, you know, I never knew I was capable of doing this because I was forced to do it. We started off bootstrapped, continued to be bootstrapped. And the more we did it, the more we realized that all the funding, all the hype, all the headlines and social media posts that you can post when, you know, raise funds don't really matter. It's all about um, what you've been able to achieve by yourself. And I think we both come from a very similar background, underprivileged. Um, you know, we had to do a lot of things ourselves. He learned to code himself. I had to build my life from scratch myself. And why would you do it differently in a business? So yeah, lots of lots of questions off the back of that. So you bootstrap, that's a conscious decision. You're digging deep. You talked about like relentless and, and like super hard. What were those kind of first 30 days like? I think it was a lot about how can we speak to as many people as possible? We didn't, I think when you kind of 
pause or park any negative thoughts or fears and focus on what matters, speaking to people, bringing in revenue, validating your product, creeping into uh, competitors' lives. Those were the kind of things that we were we cared about since day one. We just wanted to prove that we could do it. We wanted to prove that we had built something that no one was able to build with the same resources we had. So, which was how many? The two of you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was um, it was just the two of us and working day and night. I wouldn't advise it. It, was, it wasn't the healthiest thing to do. Um, looking back at it, to be fair, but we we couldn't have done it any other way. And I think, again, looking back at things, I it it's a blessing because now we didn't dilute for no reason. We learned how to do everything and wear the multiple hats. Um, and now we got the business in a in a pretty stable and very fast growing position. Now it's just about kind of adding a bit more fuel to the engine rather than starting the engine pre-built. How hard was it like in, in those first 30, 60, 90 days? Like what, what, what you said you're working day and night. Yeah, it was like, a shell is more. It was a shock. It was a shock to me, to my family. Um, I think I didn't expect it to be that difficult and I think that was fine. Um, it was a lot of hard work day and night suddenly lost my uh like my social life suddenly started disappearing day and night um just to build and kind of continue executing i think mentally it was uh like i said i've i've gone through a few things in my life but um it was definitely needed a, a different level of mental strength in my opinion because you're kind of we didn't have a lot of advice starting off, so we had to find a lot of things out ourselves. And you could only do that by just constantly tailoring and listening to feedback and failing and iterating, etc. So we didn't really have a baseline of kind of what we're doing is right or what we're doing is wrong. And we had to find out ourselves through hard work and through failing. And I think um, giving up or just kind of forgetting about I mean, giving up was never an option. We just, any failure, any disappointment was just like, hey, we just laugh it out. It was a, a learning experience. And I think when you don't have that, when it's just the two of you and you don't really kind of know whether you're going into the right or wrong direction, you just have each other and some of the ad, like advisors or people around you, but they're not actively working in the yeah. company. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very hard. So I learned to trust myself and to know that there's not just one way of doing something. There's so many more, there's so many different ways of doing the same thing and you can get to the same destination in so many different ways. So just learn to trust myself and my decisions and to execute and kind of what, like I said, I, I, I was a perfectionist, which was kind of, again, making things more difficult for me especially when there was no baseline to go by or no <laughs> reference to, to compare things against. So I just learned that, you know, when you think something makes sense and you validate it and the market <laughs> validates it too, execute on it. And then even if it fails, you learned how to do it better next time. And that's, um, that, that was a big learning experience. Cause that sounds like a pretty different mentality to the businesses you had before, where you said it was like, you were being very thorough, almost not pulling the, you know, the trigger to, to make a decision. Was that self-taught again or was that your co-founder coaching you and pushing you to, you know, we need to go like, or was that learning from the SDR environment? The, like, what, where did that come from? I think it's, it was a combination of the above. Okay. <laughs> um, my co-founder is what I would, ex well, when I met him, what I would describe as very scrappy, um, just executes, builds and launches and doesn't overthink anything. Yeah. I, I was, I learned to become that way through, again, the failures in the past and my sales experience and a few other things, but not on that level. So seeing him kind of launch things and do things um, that didn't always have years of logic and calculations behind them and them still working out incredibly well just taught me to execution is the most important thing. And 
executing and failing is better than not executing in the first place. Yeah. And would that be advice you would give other founders? Absolutely. That are- yeah. I think, I think I still see it today. I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs or like soon to be entrepreneurs who are thinking of leaving their job and starting their own thing. And like I've, I've spoken to people who've been thinking about the same plan or product for the past 18 months mm. and they they're scared to launch because they have x y or z concerns and i think doing something and failing is much better than not doing it like i just said so some of the advice i'd give is stop being a perfectionist and i feel so ironic saying that because i've always known myself as <laughs> like yeah an overthinker yeah. and a perfectionist which again i've learned to just ditch because i was forced to so don't overthink it go out and do it and learn from failures like maybe a lot of people have this kind of mindset but it's genuinely only failures that teach you a lot so mm. failing is a learning experience it's, i think it's all about your mindset or it's all about a viewpoint it's about how you see things and um if you see failures if you if you get worried by failures you're not going to get too far because mm. startup life is full of failures yeah you're working day and night how long from that point to like okay we're on to something here like we're signing customers our close rate is you know 30 percent or 40 percent what was that period i think it was not so long to be fair like it was in it was a month roughly which was very good i think when i joined and when i kind of committed full time to salesfinity there was a lot of great stuff the idea was amazing the product was was great and I think we just had to kind of puzzle a few things out of some of the missing pieces where the actual ex- like closing or the sales execution startups are all about sales. And I think to date, I've, I've met loads of founders who have millions in funding, have some of the biggest investors, but they don't know how to sell. And they're still insisting on doing things the traditional way of going to events and using their network. But you'll only know if something if you're onto something when you sell it and when you do it the right way and when you can build a whole business case around it so if it's just a product and you don't know why you sold it you you might you might have marketed it very nicely you might have convinced the other person and you sold it but if there's no actual business case behind it if there's no alignment with the direction of the business you're selling into it's very hard to validate that you've got that you're onto something. Yeah. And I think it started with us putting together the first business case um, with our customer, which was also a big deal. I think it was um, one month in, we had multiple deals, the biggest being 28K. Mm. And obviously that, that took a lot of planning and a lot of kind of strategizing and the business case made, made sense. It got approved by the CEO. And that's kind of when we knew we're definitely onto something. How did that feel? It was amazing. Um, <laughs> we, w- I mean, it was remote. Me and my co-founder, we couldn't high five, but the excitement <laughs> was definitely there. <laughs> and how were you building pipe? Like, were you, were you, you know, eating your own food? You were doing the calling. Yeah, cold calling. I um, how many? We 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 used to have these call blitzes. Like, we'd get on a call and make calls together, and then. Um, eventually we also got two people on board as like contractors or commission only pretty much yeah. because the product was so good and the pipeline <laughs> potential was there. They were able to make a, a living full time just off being on commission. So that definitely helped, but it started off by us doing it ourselves. Like I remember my co-founder making, um, cold calls himself and posting it on LinkedIn with a transcript and kind of showing people how he moved a prospect from an absolutely no to okay when can i get some time in your calendar um and then yeah these these are the things that we kind of started doing posting online linkedin was massive for us it made a lot of sense because salespeople live on linkedin they're prospecting yeah. all day and posting what we were doing on linkedin helped us build some crazy initial um, traction and how like what was the volume like give us some numbers like how many discoveries were you doing a day how many meetings were you booking in a month yeah yeah it was my my calendar pretty much within two months became full day and night like we had a lot of traction from the uk um obviously the initial traction came from america 
me being in London, I uh, was doing UK hours, starting off, you know, at nine with meetings and then finishing at one or two a.m. UK time because I was covering Pacific time zone. Yeah. Um, in terms of numbers, it was we built a pipeline of one point seven million dollars in around three months time. Um, so yeah, those are some of the numbers I can, I can provide. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's super interesting, right? Because if you think about the challenge of so many companies right now, <clears throat> it is pipeline. It is like being able to even book meetings. It's cutting through the noise. You talked about being, you know, not a nice to have and a, a critical product. What was the business case? Like how, how, how did you position that to, to be so, so important? We tied the product to a top line strategic priority, which is revenue. In a world, we recognize that today, revenue is drying up, top of funnel is drying up, funding is drying up. And while funding is drying up, you only have one source of living or surviving, which is revenue. Now, if top of funnel is also a problem, then it's very hard to survive in the long term. So we push the message of the growth at all costs is, you know, the world of growth at all costs is finished. Now you have to survive off revenue. Uh, you don't have revenue. There's no pipeline. It's a very crowded market. So you have to do 10x hmm. what you're doing today. And to hire 10x more people, you're going to still run out of money and you're still not going to survive because of the cash burn. So what do you do? You use AI to 10x the output of each of your people today. And on a high level, that's pretty much the, the, the value, you know, tying a platform directly to the survival of a company, yep. um, helping startups or preventing startups from going down rounds, like reducing their valuation because they're not going to survive or preventing startups from dying because they're unable to raise their next round of funds because they don't have any pipeline and mm -hmm. there's no revenue coming in. These were some high level priorities that most CEOs would definitely care about. And if we just sold it as, hey, you have a team, you're, they're just making 60 calls a day. What if they could make five times more calls? You're kind of boxing yourself um, into a very small pain point, which is uh, activities. Yeah. But if you're pitching your pain against survival of the company, it becomes a completely different discussion. It will increase the deal size. It'll help you actually close something. And for us, it very importantly helped us validate that we're onto something, like I said, because we had CEOs on the phone. Um, we had a, we met with executives kind of going from two guys to meeting CEOs of some pretty well-known companies and discussing some business cases with executives. We knew that our product definitely ties in with high level strategic priorities. Yeah. To build the, the recurring revenue to, you know, a million dollars plus in that period of time is like truly exceptional, right? Like it, it's, that's not common. How, how did you avoid going out and raising capital? So like normally, you know, the, 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 the trajectory dictates, you know, how much you can raise, um, how, at what valuation yep. and on that growth, especially even between like zero and 150,000, 200,000, there would have been a big opportunity. You're in AI, which right now is like, you know, where a lot of the money's being deployed. How did you avoid that? And I know you said it was intentional, but but mm -hmm. why? Like, why did you want to continue on that kind of bootstrapped journey? We didn't have a team of 100 people. We kept our resources incredibly restricted, a lot more than anyone could imagine at the kind of stage we were at and the success we were having, like, I think companies which were at, you know, the, the ARR that we had three months in would typically raise a few million dollars and have a team of at least 20. Yeah. And we kept, we decided that just because we're generating revenue, it doesn't mean that, you know, we, we can't handle the workload. Um, it was really about squeezing as much of ourselves out. I, I genuinely believe people don't need as much as they think they need. And as long as you have time in your calendar, you can, you have time to execute, you have time to bring in revenue. I mean, right now, obviously it's a completely different story, but, um, we didn't invest in useless softwares. Like a lot of people think they actually need to, um, 
we didn't pay ourselves any crazy salaries, kept it incredibly minimal, just about enough to survive. Yep. Um, we didn't travel. Um, we didn't have an office, so we kept everything remote, just on Zoom. A lot of things that we, uh, that a lot of founders today, unfortunately, care about and think that entrepreneurship is all about having an office and um, raising funds and doing nice marketing promos. We kept it very simple. We just... Yep kept the message the same um and another thing that i am a big believer in is if you do the right things every single day you'll achieve great things it's just about executing day on day so it doesn't take it just you need time and you need resilience that's genuinely all you need so if you were to be you know looking back right over the last 12 months critical of of your own success because you've had you know phenomenal success what would you say about about yourself? What 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 do you think you could have done better as as a founder? Um, knowing what you know now, like looking back on 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 the journey, even over the the last twelve months. Absolutely, I've got a lot to say about that one. <laughs> I think a big mistake or a big learning point was switching from an employee mindset to entrepreneur mindset is learning to not work in the business all the time i think because we started off bootstrapped everything was squeezed and very very under resourced and we still had a lot of success we kept thinking that you know we don't need to do x y and z and then it kept us working in the business and at some point we realized that if we don't execute on growing the team if we don't do x y and z like starting to actually have some conversations with investors like we don't need the money we're cash positive we're profitable but you still need those relationships you still need to prepare for the future because if you hit 10 million in revenue and there's only four of you there'll be there'll be a lot of bottlenecks and i think the biggest learning opportunity or the learning the biggest learning experience for me was shifting from being an employee where you want to get the work done you want to do the best job possible to also learning about or understanding how you can make the business independent of you, but still driving it into the right mm -hmm. direction. Because the more the business relies on you, the less scalable it can be. Yeah. So how did you actually do that? Because that sounds like a pretty big... We're still doing that. Really? <laughs> yeah. Can you have some examples? Yeah, we're, I'm, hiring is a massive one. I, then sp I shifted my time from 100% revenue to 50% hiring. A few other things was actually... So we, we have some softwares or some tools that we use on a daily basis but we weren't using we weren't using them to even 10 percent of their capacity so we kind of i mean personally i went back and learned how i could automate lots of different processes how i could link things together and then em enable or empowering those tools with with the right people so we could do a lot more like obviously in ai there's so many different ai tools today um so shifted my mindset from how can i do this myself how can I do the best job possible to how can I how can I build something that's scalable and that is re reproducible? Um, so, yeah, investing in the right tools, but also learning how to use these tools. I yeah. think it's very exciting to have lots of different tools and different technologies. Uh, I didn't know like HubSpot, for example, we're only using Hub We were using HubSpot just to, to view deals. And then when we started using it for any like a lot of different things and put like um, connecting things together, it eliminated the, the need, for example, for us to hire someone to do data input. Yeah. Final question. The, the challenge that a lot of founders are facing right now is in this current market, they are struggling to grow. They're struggling to book meetings. They're struggling to build pipeline. Yeah. What would be your kind of number one tip for them uh, out with using your product yeah. like what would you what would you actually say like if you look back on on why and how you've got to this point what is it that that makes a difference obviously within within the, the context of what what you know a big component of it comes down to knowing that no one cares about you i i say this all the time no one cares about your product no one cares about who you are or what you're doing Start putting yourself into the shoes of the people you're trying to sell to. Start putting yourself into the mindset of your buyers. I think detach from your product and your baby that you're building and understand who needs to receive it and why they would want to invest in it and why it adds value to them. 
and then basically work backwards rather than starting from the product you start from the from the potential customer that will then help you come up with the right messaging come up with the right pitch and also understand the right business case that matters um i think a lot of founders are selling amazing tools but to the wrong people or to the wrong niche or to the wrong or um using the wrong business case so it's about finding the biggest pain point that your product could solve and finding exactly who it can help and then working backwards um i still see lots of founders hiring very traditional SDRs, sending the same automated emails, templated things, um, scripted, cold calls, detached from the ordinary way of doing things. Cool. Where can people find you? Salesfinity.io. Um, we're also quite active on LinkedIn. So um, yeah, Omar, Abu Fandi, Mavlon Beck, Muratov. We are the the two guys founders and finally you've got a startup program for sales affinity yeah. do you want to talk about that yeah so we genuinely believe in helping others have uh, fast traction and kind of help founders go from zero to one in the short space of time so we the same way we would have loved to have someone support us uh, i mean we we had the we had the luxury of using our own product. Yeah. So we've opened our product up at almost a 50% discount with additional resources, advice, and uh, some exclusive VIP things for some of the best founders out there. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you.